uh, Allison Pugh, we actually met Allison through Ron Lieber, who we love very much. Ron is actually an alum of Parker. Uh, Ron is the Your Money columnist for the New York Times that we've had the pleasure of hosting multiple times. And Ron emailed saying, Lonnie, you have to meet my friend Allison, and uh, the rest was written there, um, and he's correct. So Allison is a professor of sociology at Johns Hopkins. Her research and teaching focus on how people forge connections and find meaning and dignity at home and at work, and how economic trends from job insecurity to commodification to automation can make that harder. She got her bachelor's in government from Harvard and her master's and PhD in sociology from Berkeley. Prior to her new position at Hopkins, Johns Hopkins, she taught at the University of Virginia for 17 years. She's also a former journalist, and her writing has appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times, The New Republic, and other outlets. Joining her is her fellow alum, I'm presuming from Harvard, but you tell me otherwise. I think it is from Harvard. They've known each other for some time, so he knows where all the bodies are buried. Uh, Nick Hatzis is a board-certified general and child and adolescent psychiatrist. He's the medical director of Meridian Psychiatric Partners' Child and Adolescent Division. He holds a bachelor's from Harvard, earned his medical degree at Rush Medical College, and completed his psychiatry residency and child and adolescent psychiatry fellowship at Northwestern's Feinberg School of Medicine. His clinical interests include the treatment of ADHD, mood disorders, anxiety disorders, and trauma-related disorders with psychotherapy and psychopharmacological interventions, as well as nutritional and behavioral approaches. And now, my pleasure, I'll introduce you now, Allison Pugh and Nick Hatzis. Come on up. Well, anyway. Uh, hi. Hi. Good to see you. Nice to see you. It's been like 35 years. <laughs> yeah. A little less than that, but anyway. Um, so we mentioned I'm a psychiatrist, and so a lot of times I'm kind of involved in the journey, like where somebody has been and kind of helping them where they want to go. So. In, in how that applies to you, well, what about the journey with the book? Why'd you write the book? What, where were you going? Yeah, the book was a journey. Um, I started the book because I was interested in the, the activity that, that kind of, I felt was the engine for my own success in research, by which I mean, I spend my time, I'm a sociologist, I'm a professor, I uh, spend, I've written a number of books using in-depth interviewing. And to do that, I'm not just a stenographer writing down what people say. Instead, I actually kind of try to elicit their truth. And the way I do that is by mostly reflective listening, in which I'm saying, so you're, you're saying something like this. And I might say that about something they've said, or I might say it about what they haven't said, but that I can kind of detect. Uh, often it's, you know, you know nonverbal communication, body language. You know, it's, it's actually a really intense moment of seeing the other and doing my best to do, the, to do that. They're correcting me. It's a mutual, reciprocal kind of emotional achievement. And they often end the, you know, hour or two or four or whatever it is saying, that was just like therapy. And it's not just like therapy, but I st after enough of that, I started to go, huh, it's so interesting that that's how I do my work. It's also how I do my graduate student advising. As a, as a professor, I have to kind of, um, you know, kind of coax uh, the research that graduate students end up doing, coax a dissertation out of a student. And my dissertation advisor used to say to me, I want you to sing your song. And, the, and figuring out your own song is very tricky. We can't be our own mirrors. We require another person. And that process of mirroring and witnessing and seeing the other, in-depth interviewing, PhD advising, and I just started to be like, this is, a, this is an engine that powers my work. And I started to kind of see it in many other kinds of work, coaching, therapy for sure, primary care physicians, you know, counselors of all kinds. And then I'm, then I'm like, what about lawyers? What about managers? What about high-end sales? You know, I started to kind of revel in the experience of finding it everywhere. And actually, you know, labor economists have said that we're moving from a thinking economy 
to a feeling economy. So what I'm describing is, has been recognized on a kind of broad scale by kind of economic scholars. But I felt like I was finding something, you know, kind of figuring something out that we didn't have a name for that was underneath all this kind of valuable work. And so I was like, we need a name for this. This needs to be kind of uh, made visible. Right now, we kind of assume it's part of women's nat nature. We ignore it when men do it. We, uh, we naturalize it. We, we don't think it's like a skill. We think it's something that someone just does. We don't really teach it. I was like, we need a name for this. And then I started to think, so I named it, first of all. I named it Connective Labor. And I named it because I think it's valuable. But I also started to notice how it was something that we don't know how to systematize very well. We don't know how to spread this, train it, and spread its good performance very well. So basically, to get a good teacher, often you are either lucky or you're affluent. And that's true for often doctors or other kinds. You know, like, it's, it's not spread, it's not distributed. These are, these are kind of social goods that are not distributed well. So how do we systematize this work? How do we make it more predictable? How do we, as Silicon Valley would say, scale it up? Well, in 2015, when I was starting this work, the only other people who were talking about that in the same way were AI engineers. And that's how this book started. And so a tremendous amount of time spent in, in the room with people. I always think about being in the room. Um, but another part of being in the room that you, you touch on there is you, know, you talk about the ways that the work of like tracking things and measuring and, and counting, it takes time and like focus away from the relationship. Mm. And then I thought about the, the chaplains yeah. in the book and like, oh, I've got to write my notes in three different systems. And I've encountered that as a physician, you know, mm -hmm. like we've got to make sure I'm, I'm, I'm marking this down. It takes us out of the relationship. Mm -hmm. what, what effect do you th see that having on people that do the connective labor? Mm -hmm. And then what effect on the people that are receiving it? Yeah. Uh, pernicious, in a word. Um, <laughs> um, he, he's describing a, a story that I opened the book with about, um, involving this chaplain. So I spent, I talked to like 100 people and spent about 300 to 400 hours observing people. And the people I was talking to and observing were the, the ones doing this work. So a whole bunch of therapists, a whole bunch of primary care physicians, a whole bunch of teachers, and then actually a whole bunch of people who didn't have college degrees, because I thought this work is not reserved only for those with college degrees, so I actually also um, talked to sex workers, I talked to funeral home directors, I talked to home health care aides, all kinds. Um, and then I also talked to a bunch of engineers. So I have a lot to, you know, I, I have insight, we'll say, into <laughs> how they think about this work. So what he's referring to, the chaplain, is the story that I actually open the book with. Because here I am, I felt blessed, really. I was so grateful to be able to follow her around. She's singing with people. She's praying with people. This is in a hospital, a hospital chaplain. And, you know, she's having a huge effect. She tells me this one story. A guy intubated, didn't want to be intubated, furious that he's intubated. And she sees that he's angry, and no one else is really talking to him or dealing with him. And he's so angry, but he can't talk, and he can't write. And she goes, here, take this Kleenex, Kleenex box and throw it against the wall. And in, he's like, sees that she sees him, basically. And he, she, he pulls her in. I believe he does throw the Kleenex box. And then he pulls her in by her arm. And just she sits with him for like 10 or 15 minutes. And then the next time she, next time she sees him, it's like two or three days later, he says he's been extubated. So he's no long, he now can talk, he, he, he recognizes her, and he says, there is nothing like being seen by someone you don't even know in one of the worst periods, worst moments of your life. So that was a very profound movement for both her and him. At the same time, while I'm like 
listening to these stories, watching her counsel and pray and sing with patients. I'm also watching her actually enter the data from these spiritual visits in three different data platforms. One is EPIC, the standard medical um, electronic health record, and then there are two others that her employers just kind of add onto this. And it does affect her, first of all, it's completely ridiculous. Maybe I'll <laughs> save that for later. She, she does, uh, choose, it does change her work. She does choose which units to visit based on which computers are working better. Um, she, you know, like it does, and in addition, it shrinks the time that she has to spend on the actual connective labor that she does day in, day out, and, and kind of diverts it to this kind of, you know, uh, data collection. And she, no one is billed for a chaplain's work. Why? Why are we keeping data so uh, um, assiduously on what she does? You know, it, it just wasn't clear. And I did actually end up talking to her, um, uh, you know, the kind of head chaplain who was um, ushering this along, and I can talk, talk to you about that later. But it has an enormous effect on her work. She kind of is a perfect illustration of what I found again and again talking to practitioners, the doctors who are like showing me how they can you know, look someone in the eye and take notes for the electronic health record. See, I've, I've mastered this, you know, you know contorted, contorted body position or whatever. Spoiler alert, we can't. <laughs> Spoiler alert. So um, the, the, she's not alone. She's just a perfect example. So it does, it does a lot to this work. It's like we're not valuing this work. It's part of the reason why I wrote this book and gave this thing a name to try and make it something that we can see and value. Wow, that really uh, hits me because uh, I'm, I'm in those situations mm -hmm. and there are times that I regret typing and looking mm -hmm. and there are certain moments as a psychiatrist that I have to, in, uh, I have to engage and so I put the computer away, but mm -hmm. I know every time I put the computer away, I know that that means at the end of the day, I will have hours of work to mm -hmm. remember what I did. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's striking, you know, right. which, which brings actually uh, maybe the Not AI alone. elephant into the room, um, which, so I'm gonna ask this question a couple different ways and we'll see how it goes. That's okay. fine. Um, so when does Skynet go live and when does it replace me as a psychiatrist? <laughs> okay, a well, little bit of laugh, is. somebody got something on that one. <laughs> Yeah, okay, just check in there. Uh, and so what I'm trying to say <laughs> is what do people get like wrong about mm. AI in terms of like those sadder, more frightening predictions? I mean, there was a quote in the book, like are we destined to be AI's pets or livestock? Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't, wasn't a very comforting thought, yeah. but uh, what, 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 uh, uh, what do you think people get wrong about it? Yeah, yeah, I have a lot to say about this. Okay, so the first thing is, what, what, do, what does data analytics or data entry and AI have to do with each other? Let's just bridge that for you. Realize that it does in two ways. The first is, remember that the whole kind of premise of the book was thinking about like, how do we systematize this work? So the first way that employers systematize it is they try and kind of fit it into um, existing boxes and uh, be able to control it and gather data about what is happening and impose uh, kind of um, scripting on it. I would call it checklists and manuals and you know like kind of that's the first way that employers or organizations try and get it under control. Um, and then once I would say once it is, uh, I'll say it degraded in that fashion. There's a slippery slope from that to its automation. And we see that happening. It's not that, uh, despite you know, many dystopian stories, it's not that AI engineers are running go around going, you know, what's the personal interaction you love the most? Okay, we're gonna automate it. That's not how it works. Actually, what happens is they kind of um, degrade it with either scripting or um, you know, kind of imposing a lot of data analytics on it until it starts to feel like not very good or not very human 
or not very personal. And then it's a slippery slope to us really not noticing that whole incremental process and thinking that it's automation is OK. And there are actually many examples. Um, and this is to foretell in the conclusion, I talk about um, self-checkout and how in the 1920s, that was actually a connective labor job in which male clerks uh, would uh, take your grocery list and talk to you about your aunt, whomever, who was allergic to whatever, and does she want the, you know, like he knew your family. He knew, and then it became, when it, when it became something that uh, involved cashiers at the front while people did their own shopping, it became a more routinized, more feminized, more standardized job, and more open to automation over 100 years. But you said, your initial question was, so that was my, my preface saying, this is why data entry and data collection is relevant for an AI conversation. But your question was, what are we getting wrong with AI? There's so much we're getting wrong with AI. <laughs> um, OK, the first is critics of AI are missing a, a crucial thing. So first of all, you've heard, we have all heard, the main uh, ways people are critical of AI. They talk about bias, they talk about surveillance, and they talk about job disruption, right? We've all heard those three, like people are nodding. What we aren't really talking about yet is human relationship and human connection. And that is at risk. There is automated human connection happening right now. Uh, there are therapy chatbots. There are, you know, AI assistants. There are, you know, this, there's, I spoke to many engineers whose this is their primary occupation. The socio-emotional AI is the fastest growing area of AI. Um, yeah, so that's the first thing even the critics are getting wrong. The technologists themselves, there's a lot they're getting wrong. The way, that, the way that they sell this work, another thing that I enjoy doing with these book events is I feel like they can be an inoculation for you because you can hear, you're going to hear these arguments or these kind of the way it's sold to you. And you're going to be like, oh, yeah, that's that. So here they are. There are three ways it's sold to you. The first is that it's better than nothing. We have all heard that. And tons of engineers have told me about that. You know, they're, they're not terrible people. They're in it to, some of them are in it to make the world a better place. It's very common. And some of the ways they think that they are doing that is by offering, say, a therapy bot or a virtual nurse or a palliative care consultant. These are all real examples to people who don't get access to that normally. So it's a better than nothing uh, argument. I'm going to tell you the fallacy, which I hope you can hear, but maybe you can't, is that this is a, they're offering a technological solution to a political problem, a problem that we are, I don't even political, a problem of staffing and like basically uh, funding, funding for public clinics, funding for pub public classrooms. Like there's a reason there isn't widespread access and availability of these things, and a lot of it has to do with a kind of decimated public sphere. So a capitalist, yeah. a capitalist problem? I mean, I, I know I didn't, didn't go there I mean, in terms of our, our talk, but like, is, uh, do you mean? Yes. OK. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's the first one. Second one, maybe I won't give you them all right now. I'll, let, I'll feed you the second one, and then I'll give you the other one later. <laughs> the second one is another one we have all heard. AI will free us up. Free us up for more meaningful work. I mean. I'm seeing the nods. That's very common. Even McKinsey wrote a whole report about this. Like it's, very, it's a way that people talk about AI. The first thing I want to say is this work, connective labor, is among the most meaningful work that people do. So why are we automating this work? But also, I think it's very naive because it, uh, it are, it, it, it's the premise is that um, employers, once um, you know, like we are freed up from the work that we kind of are doing, that they'll spend the time then trying to make it more meaningful, give us more meaningful work, instead of just 
letting us go. Like, that's, um, you know, the capitalism that we live with in America is about saving labor costs. It's not about how can we make your job more meaningful. And so often, yeah, so those are two ways in which it is sold. They are both rely on kind of a fallacy, I would say, that is um, fairly transparent. Yeah, that's maybe where I'll end. There's another one, but we'll another, save that for later. We're holding it, where it's just like a little amuse bouche we're going to get later. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Not that I probably said that right, but anyway. No, you um, said it perfect. Oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I knew it was going to be nice to see you again. Like, so, you. <laughs> uh, so, you know, another, um, I mean, in terms of sort of talking about things that might sound a little scary, right? Like you, early on, you talk about the depersonalization crisis. And, and, and a crisis of, of loneliness that's talked about. And you know, I think about some of the work I, I look at. So like there's a psychologist, Thomas Joyner, um, who uh, came up with an interpersonal theory of, of suicide and why, why people do that. And he talked about qualities that lead us there, like a thwarted sense of belongingness, a perception of burdensomeness, a profound mm -hmm. hopelessness, and overcoming our, our fear of death. Jonathan Haidt, a social psychologist, wrote up a, a book recently that I'm mm -hmm. sure many people are familiar with, The Anxious Generation. Mm -hmm. and, and he talks about the impact of social media and smartphones and the changes in our parenting styles. And maybe that we've created a, a, a generation that has far less resilience, more, more vulnerable to things, which is resulting in the crisis that I sometimes see in the, in the mental health world and things we're, we're not able to address. Mm -hmm. What is the threat that you see from the depersonalization crisis Mm -hmm. And how do we change things? How do we, how do we help? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, so I actually uh, have something to say about the loneliness crisis. Mm -hmm. That um, the loneliness crisis, so it's a kind of widely accepted fact out there that there is a loneliness crisis. You know, we have the Surgeon General talking. We have, um, you know, there's a loneliness minister in uh, the UK and in Japan, um, you know, but here's a kind of secret that that's actually not widely accepted in social science. We actually don't have, it's not obvious. It's a mix, it, it's debated, it's hotly debated. And the reason is because we can't find it really in the data. Like people say, when we compare now compared to 20 years ago or 30 years ago, it's not clear that they have fewer friends, fewer confidants. How would you measure people's, both people's objective and uh, kind of objective, meaning counting the number of friends, or, and also like sense of loneliness? Like those are, it's it kind of, it's not clear that that has um, radically expanded or, or contracted, depending on what you're talking about. Um, that said, we know loneliness matters. So it's not, we're not saying loneliness doesn't matter. We're just saying we're not, it's not clear that it's worse. Um, so we know who, you know, young people are very likely to be lonely. We know that also about the elderly. Um, and we know that it has, you know, direct impact on uh, physical and mental well being. So it's really important. It's just not clear that it's worse. So I think that it's actually. Um, a misnomer for what we do face. And Nick mentioned what I think we do face, which I would call a depersonalization crisis. And that is a different thing. That's about how people kind of are yearning uh, to be seen by another person. And the way, and, and that's uh, kind of being met by a lot of technology and a lot of kind of standardization, a lot of experience in kind of mass um, events where you're not recognized for your unique qualities or whatever. And both of those are having this impact of, on people of feeling not very seen. And big tech's response is, unfortunately, um, you know, personalized education, personalized medicine. But the problem with those is, of course, there's no person involved. I want us instead to call that customized, because that's what it is. It's tailored to you, your medical needs, your the skills, or you know how much you know about algebra or whatever. Like that's 
that's what you know, personalized education and pers personalized medicine is. But what if we don't just want to be seen as these uh, kind of customized uh, education and medicine promise, but that we want to be seen by a human being? The depersonalization crisis is you know, a way of pointing to that. Now, I want to kind of add here that I'm not actually a Luddite. <laughs> I don't actually hate AI. I use it. I, you know, like I believe in science. I vaccinate my children. You know, like, like I'm not, um, uh, you know, I believe in AI. It's just that I am uh, kind of picky about where, and I want us all to be picky about where we welcome and encourage it. So AI to discover a new antibiotic or 10, great. You know, AI to decode um, what sperm whales say to each other, great. These are all like real things that AI has been doing. But I actually want us, and I think this is my answer to how do we forestall a depersonalization crisis, I want us to evaluate AI with a connection metric. I want us to say, is this going to affect, how does this affect the way humans interact with each other? And if it gets in the way or replaces or makes worse, we discourage this. We say, that's not a good idea. You know, I want us to kind of get our hands on the steering wheel in a way that in the United States, we do not. Um, so yeah, like, I'll say one more thing. Um, the, um, Sometimes you'll hear from the um, technology, from Silicon Valley, they'll say to critical thinkers, they'll say, um, well, this is what people said at the about the car. This is what they said about the telephone. You know, this is just kind of anti-technology. And I want to say, in answer to that, I want to say, like, can we look at like LA and the way it has no public transportation system, you know, or, or such, a, such a, you know, kind of, anemic public transportation system. Like when we think about the way the car was introduced in certain cities and how it eradicated, um, as historians have told us, eradicated their public transportation system, there's, there are ways to embrace science and kind of direct it to uh, kind of shape the society we want to live in. And that's what I'm trying to do for kind of human relationship and AI. And I think that if we can have a kind of critical approach in this way and a hands-on critical approach and not be afraid to dive in as like kind of public citizens, um, we can uh, start to push back against a depersonalization crisis. I can tell I have one more thing to say and this is kind of pretty intense, but it's actually kind of what I'm thinking my next book might be, which is, <laughs> and I actually don't know if there are um, uh, people who are working in this industry in this audience, but I'm just going to say it, which is, <laughs> which is, I actually think that the reason why we call this a loneliness crisis is because there is an industry that profits off of our sense of loneliness, and uh, they they uh, you know kind of are offering for sale, you know, social media or a social network. But what they give us is what has been called by other people social snacking, not like about as filling as a McDonald's meal. And so they are essentially profiting off of this sense of alienation and anomie. And uh, we need to kind of recognize that they're kind of merchants of loneliness that um, uh, need a proactive response. So. <laughs> Will that book have like the chicken Big Mac in the title? <laughs> I don't think so. Okay, just checking because that <laughs> sounded like. Okay. Um, you know, you, you talked about some things just then. Now, highlight some of the uh, the things about the the connections again. You used, well, I mentioned before you used the word capitalism a lot in the book. Yeah. But another word that you used a lot in the book was magic. Yeah. And uh, and you know, there's some aspect of that connection between yeah. the laborer and the receiver that created um, better, more satisfying outcomes. I think yeah. the, the clinic was an example of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so how does that involve the, the mirroring 
uh, you described? Like, what are the times you observe that happen? Yeah. And, um, and, you know, like you said, people said, oh, that was happening between you and them. So other part of that question, what was that like for you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. And I really want to hear your own response, your own sense of does your work involve magic? I'm curious about that. <laughs> um, my, uh, yeah. So, so the word magic, um, I use advisedly uh, to kind of convey that something that the people told me, which is that it's not always kind of um, easily talked about what happens between people. And that actually ends up being a whole chapter. I end up kind of going, what about this is not automatable? I come up with my own little checklist, but it's not a checklist of just how to do it. It's a checklist of what is uh, elusive or, or you know, what, is, what is particularly challenging to automate. And the first of those is what this therapist, Wanda, described as, I said, you know, how do you, I asked her, how do you know you're doing it right? And she was like, well, the air gets kind of hot and there's like an energy. And then I was like, how do you know when you're doing it wrong? She was like, when, it, when, you're, when it's bad, there's like a halting. There's like a stopping. She kind of loses her capacity to really talk about it because she's talking about what other people, teachers, other therapists, even doctors, would call a vibe in the room. A teacher called it a spidey sense. There's a kind of uh, not that accessible to language description of what happens between people. And it's kind of interesting because neurologists, you know, the hardest of hard sciences, are actually kind of chasing this down also. Mm. There's a whole, a whole um, area of neuro neuroscience called second person neuroscience, um, critiquing their own discipline for spending all their time on the individual and the MRI and what the individual brain is doing and actually saying, no, 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 what happens between two brains that are trying to um, kind of intersect or interact. And uh, they have always, well, you know, their own ways of measuring that. <laughs> but I'm over here with magic. But, um, <laughs> but they, um, I did, I was privileged to see it in action. So while I talk about it as like seeing the other, and that sounds very discursive, oh, sounds like you're saying whatever, you know, sounds like, sounds like you mean this, you know, that's the way. I often do it, but when I saw it in action, sometimes it was verbal and sometimes it was not. So you mentioned the clinic. I spent a lot of time in an HIV clinic observing, and there was one really powerful exchange between a widower who had lost his wife, you know, a couple months before. So this was the first um, kind of doctor visit he had um, since he had lost his wife. And he comes in, and he's carrying, he's, he looks to me like, like Willie Nelson. He's like kind of old. He's got this bandana. He's a construction worker or a contractor. And he's got like, um, I don't know, you know, 50 pieces of paper that had clearly been folded and unfolded and all crinkly on his lap. And he's like, my wife used to do all the insurance, and it's just too hard. I can't figure it out. I get home at 11. I can't, you know. He was just so clearly missing her. He's telling, her, telling us about what side of the bed he sleeps on. He sleeps on my side. I sleep on my side of the bed. Well, actually, she thought it was hers. And he's telling us all about this kind of argument they used to have about which side of the bed was whose. And it's just clear he's in the throes of grief, and it's very present. And this uh, physician, who I'd been kind of uh, watching for some time, you know, stops typing comes over, wheels his thing right over, you know, sits right in front of him, says, you know, we have, um, you know, people who will help you with the insurance crackly papers and that kind of thing. And somehow the guy starts to feel like it's a safe space or something. So he starts to talk about how he sees his wife actually in like an orb coming at night and like he's having these visions. And he's like, I can tell you don't believe me. And this physician, who I'm sure does not believe him, he's very kind of, um, is like, doesn't matter what I believe. Does that make you feel better? He's like, yeah, it makes me feel better. And it just was like, a, I think, a, it just felt like a profound moment where the initial seeing 
helped him take that risk, kind of, of sharing this otherworldly experience. And um, that was a, that was a, I think, a, for me, it was a profound moment of being honored to even be in the same room. I'm, I'm sitting in the back, kind of trying not to be present. Or it's a very tiny room, so he knows I'm there. But um, yeah, it was, it was very moving for me to see that. And you asked about my own experience. So yeah, I, it, it's all over. I do it all the time. <laughs> So like two days ago, for example, I was talking to a grad student about her dissertation and she had told me, we had gone out to dinner the night before and she had told me that she went into sociology because her mother um, like was a newly single mom and had to like kind of discover how to, how to make a living and, you know, became a kind of, start. I think she cleaned houses or something like that, but then became kind of an entrepreneur with that and kind of, so now she studies like se occupation and occupations and work and sex um, discrimination or something like that. And then the next day we're meeting again. She's talking about her dissertation and she's telling me about stuff she's thinking about doing. And I kind of was like, "Are you not doing? Are you not doing something about your mom?" And she kind of stops, like she stops, and. She, we talk a little bit more, and then she was like, you know, that, that was in my essay to apply, that was in my application essay for grad school. Hmm. Now, I don't have an agenda. I do not care what she, she could write her dissertation on absolutely anything. She's not even my grad student. So, like, I, but I'm just there to reflect to her what I felt lurking from the dinner. I have this prior knowledge. I felt lurking underneath this, and I want her to sing her song, as my advisor said to me, mm -hmm. not sing the song that like the discipline has hammered into her about what makes a good question and what's an interesting, you know, like I felt like she had been kind of steered and I just wanted her to hear her own voice. She may still choose the other way as kind of more, uh, I don't know what, better for the job market or something like that, but I wanted her to hear it and it felt like when she said, that was what I wrote my application essay about, that was a moment of her saying, I feel seen. It may not be convenient <laughs> what you're saying, but at least I feel seen at that moment. So I see it, it happens all the time for me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's really, uh, it's incredibly powerful when it happens. And, uh, and sometimes I, I have experienced that happening mm -hmm. and sometimes I've missed it, but then yeah. it comes back later and they're like, well, you know, here is this note I wrote about our work together. And, and sometimes in my head, I'm like, you guys barely listened to me. Like, I, like what, what was going on? Like, you barely, I, I barely felt heard. But then in psychiatry, we're always thinking about, like, who's in the room? Meaning, yeah. who am I to them? Who are they to me? Yeah. And, 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 and we, we, we uh, that's, what we, that's what we run into. Um, well, the good news in the in my research anyway, I, and I feel like this is coming from um, the therapeutic uh, community, is that mistakes are actually helpful. Now, therapists were the ones who kind of figured this out for me or, or flagged this for me. And then as soon as they did that, I actually started asking all of the people, the doctors, the teachers, the, all these people, yeah. like, have you made a mistake and what happened? But the therapists were like, yeah that can actually have a huge impact. If I, so I had a, a therapist who was working in a VA hospital and she described um, see, um, seeing this patient, this woman, and she had been, um, she said something and it must have been, felt like a deep mis misrecognition um, because the woman kind of at the end of the session gets up and says something about how she's gonna be pretty busy coming up, so it might be a couple weeks, and she's, she kind of leaves. And this therapist, Sarah, her name was, yeah. tells me like, yeah, I, I just, it just felt like something was off. So she calls her in the middle of the week, and is like, you know, I, I think I got something wrong there. Can you, can you come back in and just set me straight? Like, what, what did I get wrong, and how can, how can I do that better? 
and she came in, they had a whole conversation, and she says, this, Sarah was telling me that this woman made a huge amount of progress. And at the end of their ser series of sessions or whatever, she said, what do you think made a difference? And Sarah said, that moment when you said, I think I made a mistake, and, and that that wasn't good enough. Like, really, it's not just the mistake, it's also the, the uh, kind of trying to redeem it by getting it right that can be a very powerful moment of saying, of intention. I want to see you, even if I'm not doing a great job. And in my experience and in other people's uh, that have told me, you don't have to do it perfectly. Like that's another thing. This is not something that is only available to the people who do it perfectly. Do it, you know, you, you kind of make an effort and they'll, it's a, it's a reciprocal, you know, kind of mutual process. So they'll tell you if you're getting it wrong. You just have to be kind of trying, and a lot of time you're like, no, that's not right, it's more like this, and it's a give and take. And um, this kind of therapeutic rupture, the rupture to the therapeutic alliance, and the kind of uh, reaffirmation of it is something that the therapists know and told me about. And so then I started asking the others. Um, I would say that teachers could, could recognize it, told me stories about that. Doctors, it was hard for them to say mistakes were okay. Like they're so, uh, oh, yeah, 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 yes. mistakes no, are tough. Mistakes but then I was like, rough. I'm not talking about medical mistakes. Just tell me about relationship mistakes. Yeah. So then they were like more open to that. Yeah, the, the hardest thing I think sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll joke about sometimes the hardest thing for me to say to somebody is I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we're driven toward perfectionism in the, in the medical field. And mm -hmm. I will always use the mantra, the perfect is the enemy of the good. Yeah. And, uh, and so I can, I can, we could spend another hour if we wanted to review the therapeutic mistakes I've made in the re and either the times <laughs> I've been able to come back from it with the patient or not, but we yeah. won't do that. <laughs> okay. um, don't have the time. <laughs> People didn't come here for that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm I'm going to go to another question a little bit about the, um, I, I keep coming back to that, uh, the, 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 the capitalism part and the um, sort of the, the divide a little bit. And, 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 uh, um, and, uh, and so, you know, I was like struck um, by the, the person who talked about like the, the washing of the feet mm -hmm. uh, to, to make that connection, mm -hmm. um, and 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 you know, you describe some of the healthcare workers and their responses to systems, and and they're in the system, and they found deep meaning in their jobs of serving. Mm -hmm. But it seemed that then they ultimately moved on mm -hmm. to roles that would limit the range of their clientele, um, like setting up the concierge services, yeah. for example. Mm -hmm. And um, and do you think do you think that will like create a have and a have not divide mm -hmm. in society as to who gets connective labor? Mm -hmm. will, it, like, will it be a luxury? Is it a luxury? Mm, yeah. Okay, that's a great question. Um, that question gets right at kind of the future as grounded in the present. Mm -hmm. and, that it, and one of the futures that we are staring in the face, or actually hurtling towards, I would say, is, this is, is the, scary the part. inequality this is scary part. future. Yes, okay. exactly. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> the inequality future. And that's where, um, you know, rich people get artisanal connective labor. Um, and actually, this is already happening. So think about um, the economists tell us that the uh, fastest growing occupations in the United States today are personal services to rich people. So that would be personal trainer, personal chef, personal investment counselor, any, anything with the word personal in front of it. And those people are doing connective labor. Like that is what they're doing. That's the, the reason for the personal um, in their job description or job title. So in this future, that is already starting, or the seeds of which are already being planted, the wealthy get this kind of personal services, personal connective labor, human connective labor, artisanal human connective labor from somebody 
who themselves will get it from a bot. And that is the stratification of human connection that we are aiming at right now, this luxury that you're describing of human contact. That is a future that is uh, starting right now. I'm going to give you two other futures. Unfortunately, none of them are great. But they're all very possible. They're all based on stuff that's happening right now. So another future is the, what I call the triage future. And that doctors were actually almost welcoming of this. They certainly see it happening right now. So that's where um, AI or machines will take a, care of the simple emotional needs or problems. And then anything that gets that, that's a little more complicated will get to, will get, that'll be what humans take care of. So you can already see that in like say call centers or you know, when you're like going, you're getting, trying to get to a human, you're like, agent, agent. And that's because the easy ones are just being taken care of by the bot and the more complicated get to, uh, get to an AI, I mean get to a human. And then the third one is the dividing one. The hu machines are for thinking and humans are for feeling. And that kind of division, I think, is actually the most interesting one. And here's why. Because uh, first of all, it seems to kind of um, do interesting things to gender. Um, it kind of transforms a gender division into a human-machine division. Because right now, uh, or for years, uh, women's work has been more traditionally the feeling jobs, and men's work have been more traditionally the thinking jobs. And uh, women and, and women's pay disparity, it, we have found, you know, this is a robust, robust finding, that the more you have an in-person um, kind of a job that requires in-person connective labor, the less you get paid. And so, for example, comparing, say, primary care physicians who do a ton of connective labor and, say, radiologists who do basically none, uh, radiologists make we'll say 3x, something like that, two, two to 3x of what a primary care physician does. And yet radiologists are the ones that are going to be replaced sooner than primary care physicians uh, if AI news is correct. So for instance, you may have seen that um, AI, I mean, th there's some pushback here, but there are some findings that AI has been more successful than humans in identifying um, anomalies in x-rays, for example. So people have heralded that as like the, the demise of the radiologist's job. I certainly would not go into radiology if I was in medical school right now. And um, so I talked to some radiologists about this, and they were like, we've got to become more patient-facing. That's the way <laughs> we're going <laughs> to, that's the way we're going to save this, um, you know, this job that we have. So who owns patient Facing, faces, who owns patient time? Primary care physicians own patient, patient time. So I kind of feel like going to the primary care physicians and saying like, you know, this could be a moment to kind of monkey with the pay disparity here. It feels a little, it feels like you have some power here that, um, you know, should translate into something. Now, at the same time, um, just to be frank, we all should know, these are, this is a fallacy, that, there's, that this is separable, that there are jobs that are all feeling and all thinking. Because of course, they all are both, and, or, or they, they bleed into each other. And to separate them like that is, is a fallacy. The, only other, the other thing I would add here is that the problem with, dry, with drawing a line and saying, like, this is real human work. And over there, that's just rote. That's, that's what, you know, we can just kind of automate that because that doesn't matter. It's because the reason why that's a problem is because that line moves. That line, I call it the automation frontier, and it has moved dramatically. And it's, it, I feel like this research was uh, illuminating for the, the debates, the active contestation over the automation, active fighting over the automation frontier from my, my interviewees. So I had engineers going, yeah, like an intake nurse. People, some people might say it's not rote, but really it's just asking a bunch of questions. 
And then I had an intake nurse in my, um, in my sample of people I talked to, and she was like, the hospital wants me to finish this in 15 minutes. They've given me a, finish each intake. They've given me a, a, a questionnaire, and it's just, I can't do it. She was working in a, um, she was working at a VA hospital, and she was kind of a counselor or a therapist, and it was, so it was a mental health intake. And she was like, I just will not do it. I have a guy, he's come, he's never been to a therapist before. He's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like, you know, asking him question number 14 on this, you know, sample, I mean, on this survey, and, and I'm not gonna, you know, I'm just not gonna do that to him. He, you know, it, it destroys the connection we have. And she describes someone who like shut down at question 14, which is apparently asking about some kind of suicidality or something like that. And do you have a gun? And that's when he went, Poof, and I'm, I'm not answering any more questions. And so she was like, you know, I, and so we, she was like, the connection we had was completely lost at that point. And she spent the next 45 minutes trying to like reforge it and found a way to do that. But to her, this is not rote. And to the engineer, it's just asking a bunch of questions. So you can kind of hear the kind of transformation of her job with the survey does actually uh, bring the automation frontier and have it cross over her job. And yeah, that's what I'd say. Yeah. It's uh, you know, interesting, uh, just side note. Um, I don't know if you ever spoke to my mother, but the, <laughs> the night nurse? that I said, oh, I got into a psychiatry residency at Northwestern, yeah. she picked that night to say, did you ever think about being a radiologist? <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, uh, but I think that was more about the pay disparity. So um, <laughs> God rest her soul, she's a lovely woman. Um, uh, you know, so is, is there anything that, you, know, you bring up about this automation um, frontier. Um, is there anything that makes connective labor uniquely human? Well, that's, I love that question because it's actually a complicated answer, even though I have a whole chapter on how, what makes it hard to automate. Because when you listen to, like, so for instance, on The Daily, the, the podcast, yeah. The Daily, um, ChatGPT had just come out and Michael Barbaro asks ChatGPT, like, you know, why am I a perfectionist? Or where does perfectionist come from? Or something like that. Perfectionism come from? Or something like that. And it comes back in 10 seconds or less. You know, perfectionism, perfectionism reflects anxiety about whatever. You know, like. I he, thought it was a mother that wants you to be a radiologist. <laughs> maybe that's it. <laughs> anyway, he says something. And he breaks in. As he's reading what the ChatGPT reply is, he breaks in and goes, oh. I feel seen. And that was a moment of automated connective labor, to be sure. So can machines do this work? They might be able to. So we have to think to ourselves as a society, what do we care about here? Do we just care about the individual student or patient or client, and whether or not they feel seen, even if it's by a machine? Or do we care about what those people create, workers and client, therapist and client, patient and doctor, et cetera, what they create together? That kind of amorphous social good that actually has been found to contribute to belonging and to community and to a collective that we are a part of. And it's kind of our individualistic approach to you know, only caring about the consumer, kind of, that pays no attention to the worker and pays no attention to what they create together. But I put to you now that we are facing a kind of depersonalization crisis, as you know, but the effects of it, you can see it, where people are not feeling seen. White working class men, Black Lives Matter. These are, these are actually kind of pockets of people that are rageful because they feel misrecognized or ignored. 
And so I would actually argue that connective labor uh, matters not just for its individual impact, but for the social belonging, the social fabric that it creates. And in its absence, in its, in its fraying, we are in the presence of its fraying now with polarization, fragmentation, um, and this kind of spiraling out of uh, our social fabric. Yeah, the belongingness comes up again. I, I, I yeah. go back to my thoughts about, no, not my thoughts, but Thomas Joyner's work, and yeah. I'm always struck by that aspect of it, of trying to, I worry most about people that I feel don't have that sense of belongingness. Yes. Because right. the perception of burdensomeness comes with depression. Like, it, it hits you. Yeah. But I, I want them to desperately be part of something. Something, right. And sometimes I look for a, a church or a synagogue community or a place where adults, other adults, I'm dealing mostly with kids, yeah. where adults know you and care about you that aren't necessarily your parents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, that's vital, yeah. right. And um, it can happen online, you know, like, but as I say, it's going to be more powerful, stronger, more important if we can get more in-person uh, connections happening. I think we had the signal I think that it might too. be time for people to ask their questions. Yes, I can't wait to hear. I did have three more for you to talk, but uh, 